official Terraform beginner's guide does a great job explaining the different parts of Terraform like resources, input and output variables and many other features. In this tutorial, I'll show you how to use those elements to create a real-world example. In particular, I'll show you how to provision several virtual machines in AdBS and set up a load balancer to distribute load across the cluster. You'll build a simple infrastructure to run web services and microservices that can scale and be highly available all the time. This will help you to get ready for more advanced tutorials on my channel where you'll learn how to create EKS and VPC from scratch using Terraform. This guide is designed for beginners using AWS and Terraform, so you don't need to worry if you're new to both of them. I'll guide you through the whole process one step at a time. You can find the source code in my GitHub repo. Check the link in the video description. Terraform can provision infrastructure on public clouds like AWS, Azure, Google Cloud and DigitalOcean as well as on private cloud and virtualization platforms like OpenStack and VMware. In this video, most of the code examples will use AdBS. AdBS is a great option for learning Terraform because of the following reasons. AdBS is most widely used cloud infrastructure provider so far. AWS offers a wide variety of cloud hosting services. These include Amazon EC2 for setting up virtual servers, autoscaling groups for managing groups of virtual servers more easily, and elastic load balancers for spreading traffic across the virtual server cluster. And of course, my favorite EKS for creating managed Kubernetes services. AdBS has a free tier for the first year, which should let you try out all these examples for free or at a very low cost. If you have already used up your free tier credits, the examples in this video should still cost you only a few dollars. If you don't already have AdBS account, go to adbs.amazon.com. The user interface might change in the future, but for now you can create AdBS account and follow the instructions to finish registration. You should automatically receive a free tier without needing to click on any special links. When you first sign up for NBS, you log in as a root user. This account has permission to do everything, so for security reasons it's not wise to use it daily. Instead, you should use the root user only to create other accounts with limited permissions and then switch to one of those accounts right away. You can check the official NBS documentation on how to follow security best practices in I am identity and access management. Now, to create a user account with limited permissions, you'll need to use identity and access management service. This is where you manage user accounts and their respective permissions. To create a new IAM user, go to IAM console. Search for IAM in the search bar or choose it from the list of services. Click users and then click add users. Enter a name for the user. In the past, you had to select access key, programmatic access, but this option has been removed. If it returns in the future, be sure to enable it. You can also enable AdBS Management Console access if you want to log in with this user to AdBS Console instead of using the root user, which is highly recommended. For this tutorial, let's assume we'll use the newly created IAM user with Terraform and the root user to log in to AdBS IAM console to see what Terraform created. Keep in mind that AdBS sometimes updates its web console, so what you see may be slightly different. Click Next. AdBS will ask you to add permissions to the user. By default, new IAM users have no permissions and cannot do anything in AdBS account. To give your IAM user ability to do something, you need to link one or more IAM policies to their account. IAM policy is a JSON document that defines a user's allowed or disallowed actions. 
you can create your own IAM policies or use predefined ones built into your AdBS account called managed policies. In real world scenarios, you typically create IAM groups with attached IAM policies and add users to these groups or create IAM roles with attached IAM policies and let certain users assume them. However, that's beyond the scope of this tutorial. To run examples in this tutorial, the easiest way to start is by adding the administrator access managed policy to your IAM user. Search for it and click the checkbox next to it. Keep in mind that I assume you're running examples in this tutorial in AdBS account dedicated solely to learning and testing, so the broad permissions of the administrator access manage policy aren't a big risk. If you're running these examples in a more sensitive environment, which I don't recommend, you'd want to create custom IAM policies. Click next a few more times and then click create user. You can view the user by clicking view user or just clicking on the created user. Go to security credentials section and click create access key. Choose other from the options. AdBS will always try to make you use as many managed services as possible, but don't blindly follow recommendations. Consider your own use case. Click next and create the access key. AdBS will show you security credentials for the user, which include access key ID and secret access key. Save this immediately as they won't be shown again and you'll need them later in the tutorial. Keep in mind that these credentials give access to your AdBS account, so store them securely. For example, use password manager like 1Password, LastPath or macOS Keychain and never share them. After saving your credentials, click close. In a real world scenarios, we almost never use hard-coded credentials. We typically create a dedicated IAM role for Terraform and run it on EC2 instance within AdBS with the attached IAM role. Alternatively, we sometimes use integrations with Terraform Cloud, GitHub Actions or Atlantis. Alright, you're now ready to move on to using Terraform. The simplest way to install Terraform is by using your operating system's package manager. However, in real-world scenarios, this is often discouraged. You'll want to explicitly install a specific Terraform version as each version can modify your Terraform state. Keep this in mind. For example, on Mac OS, if you use Homebrew, you can run Brew tab and Brew install. On Windows, if you chocolatey user, you can run Choco install Terraform. For installation instructions on other operating systems, including different Linux distributions, refer to the Terraform documentation. You can also install Terraform manually by visiting the Terraform homepage, clicking the download link, selecting the right package for your operating system, downloading zip archive and unzipping it into the directory where you want Terraform installed. The archive will extract a single binary called Terraform, which you should add to your path environment variable. To check if everything is working, run the Terraform command and you should see the usage instructions. For Terraform to make changes in your AdBS account, you need to set AdBS credentials for the IAM user you created earlier as environment variables, AdBS access key ID and AdBS secret access key. For example, here's how you can do it in Unix, Linux and macOS terminal using the export command to set environment variables. Here is how to set environment variables in Windows Terminal. Instead of using export, use set keyword. 
Keep in mind that these environment variables only apply to the current shell. If you restart your computer or open a new terminal window, you'll need to set these variables again. Besides environment variables, Terraform can use the same authentication methods as all AWS CLI and SDK tools. This means it can also use credentials stored in home AWS credentials path, which are created automatically when you run AWS configure or IAM roles that you can add to almost any AWS resource. All AWS examples in this tutorial use default VPC in your AWS account. A VPC or virtual private cloud is a separate area within your AWS account that has its own virtual network and IP address space. Almost every AWS resource deploys into VPC. If you don't specifically choose a VPC, the resource will be deployed into default VPC, which is included in every AWS account created after 2013. If you have deleted default VPC in your account, you can use a different region. Each region has its own default VPC or create a new default VPC using AWS Web Console. If not, you'll need to modify almost every example to include VPC ID or subnet ID parameter pointing to a custom VPC. Remember that default VPC is created by AWS for demonstration purposes and should never be used in production environments. Terraform code is written using HashiCorp configuration language in files with TF extension. HCL is declarative language, which means you describe the infrastructure you want and Terraform will determine how to create it. Terraform can create infrastructure across various platforms known as providers, including AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, DigitalOcean, and many others. You can write Terraform code using almost any text editor. Many editors offer Terraform syntax highlighting support. You may need to search for HCL instead of Terraform, including Vim, Emacs, Sublime Text, Atom, Visual Studio Code, and IntelliJ. Some, like IntelliJ, even provide refactoring, find usages, and go-to declaration support. To start using Terraform, you usually need to configure provider you want to use. Create an empty folder and add a file named main.tf with the following contents. This informs Terraform that you'll be using AWS as your provider and want to deploy your infrastructure in US East 2 region. AWS has data centers worldwide grouped into regions. AWS region is a separate geographic area like US East 2, Ohio, U West 1, Ireland, or App Southeast to Sydney. With each region, there are multiple isolated data centers called Availability Zones AZs, such as US East 2A, 2B, and so on. There are many other settings you can configure for this provider, but let's keep it simple for now. Also, for each provider, there are many different resources you can create, like servers, databases, and load balancers. The general syntax for creating a resource in Terraform looks like this. Provider is the name of the provider, example AWS. Type is the kind of resource to create within that provider, for example, instance. Name is identifier you can use throughout the Terraform code to reference this resource, for example, my instance. And config includes one or more arguments specific to that resource. To deploy a single virtual server in AWS called EC2 instance, use AWS underscore instance resource in main.tf file like this. AMI refers to the Amazon machine image that will run on your EC2 instance. The easiest way to find AMI is go to AWS console. From the navigation bar, select the region in which you want to launch your instance. You can select any region that's available to you regardless of your location. From the console dashboard, choose launch instance. Choose quick start. 
choose the operating system for your instance and then from Amazon Machine Image select from one of commonly used AMIs in the list and copy that AMI ID and use it in your Terraform code. You can also create your own AMI using tools like Packer. If you don't see the AMI you want to use, choose Browse More AMIs to browse the full AMI catalog. Keep in mind that AMI IDs differ in each AdBS region. So if you change the region parameter to something other than US is 2, you'll need to manually find the corresponding Ubuntu AMI ID for that region and update the AMI parameter accordingly in Terraform code. Instance type refers to the type of EC2 instance to run. Each type of EC2 instance offers a different amount of CPU, memory, disk space and networking capacity. The EC2 instance type page shows all available options. The example above uses G3 Micro, which has two virtual CPUs and one gigabyte of memory and is included in AdBS free tier. Terraform supports a large number of providers and each provider has many resources with dozens of arguments. It's impossible to remember them all. While writing Terraform code, you should frequently refer to the Terraform documentation to check available resources and their usage. For instance, here's the documentation for NBS instance resource. Even after using Terraform for years, many people still refer to these docs multiple times a day. Open a terminal, navigate to the folder where you created main.tf and execute the terraform init command. The terraform binary has the basic functionality but doesn't include the code for specific providers like NBS, Azure or GCP. So when you first use terraform, run terraform init to make terraform scan your code, identify the providers you're using and download their code. The provider is saved in that Terraform folder which serves as Terraform's temporary workspace. Consider adding it to the git ignore. Terraform also records the details about the downloaded provider code in terraform.log.hcl file with all specific versions. You'll discover more about init command and terraform folder later in this tutorial. For now, remember to run init when starting with new terraform code and know that it's fine to run init multiple times as it won't cause any harm. Once you have downloaded provider code, execute terraform plan command. This command will allow terraform to analyze your configuration compare it with the current state of your infrastructure and show you what changes will be made when you apply your configuration. This way you can review the planned actions before actually making any changes to your infrastructure. Always make sure to check what resources Terraform will create or remove before you execute apply command. In the output you can see that Terraform plans to create just one EC2 instance and nothing else which is precisely what we want. To actually create the instance execute terraform apply command. You'll see that apply command displays the same plan output as before and asks you to confirm if you want to proceed with the plan. Although the plan command is available separately, it's mainly helpful for quick checks and during code reviews. In most cases, you'll run apply command directly and review the plan output it shows. Type yes and press enter key to deploy EC2 instance. Alright, you have successfully deployed EC2 instance in your AdBS account using Terraform. To confirm this, navigate to EC2 console in your AdBS account and you should see your newly created instance listed there. Indeed, the instance is present, but this example might not be very exciting. To make it more interesting, let's add a name to the EC2 instance. You can do this by adding tags to AdBS instance resource in your Terraform configuration. 
Now that you have added the tags to your Terraform configuration, run Terraform Apply again to see the changes it would make to your infrastructure. Terraform keeps track of all resources it already created for this set of configuration files, so it knows your EC2 instance already exists. Notice Terraform says refreshing state when you run apply command, and it can show you a diff between what's currently deployed and what's in your Terraform code. The preceding div shows that Terraform wants to create a single tag called name, which is exactly what you need, so type yes and hit enter. When you refresh your EC2 console, you'll see something similar to this. Now that you have some working Terraform code, you may want to store it in the version control. This allows you to share your code with other team members track the history of all infrastructure changes and use commit log for debugging. For example, here's how you can create a local git repository and use it to store your Terraform configuration file and the log file. You should also create git ignore file with the following contents. The git ignore file instructs git to ignore the Terraform folder which Terraform uses as a temporary scratch directory as well as tf state file which Terraform uses to store state. In real world, we always use a remote Terraform backend to store state in remote location like S3. You can learn more about it in other tutorials on my channel. You should commit the git ignore file too. To share this code with your teammates, you'll want to create a shared git repository that you can all access. One way to do this is to use GitHub. Head over to GitHub, create an account if you don't have one already and create a new repository. Configure your local git repository to use new github repository as a remote endpoint named origin as follows. Now whenever you want to share your commits with your teammates, you can push them to a region. And whenever you want to see changes your teammates have made, you can pull them from a region. As you go through the rest of the tutorial and as you use Terraform in general, make sure to regularly git commit and git push your changes. This way you'll not only be able to collaborate with team members on this code, but all of your infrastructure changes will also be captured in the commit log, which is very handy for debugging. The next step is to run a web server on this EC2 instance. The goal is to deploy the simplest web architecture possible, a single web server that can respond to HTTP requests. In real life, you would usually create a web server using frameworks, maybe like Ruby on Rails or Django. But to make this example easy to understand, we'll use a very simple web server that always returns hello world text. This is a script that puts hello world in a file called index.html and uses a program called busybox which comes with Ubuntu. It starts a web server on port 8080 to return the content of that file. The busybox command is combined with nohub and ampersand to make the web server run non-stop in the background and allowing the script to exit. Now, how do you make EC2 instance run the script? Usually, you would use a tool like Packer to create a custom image with the web server already installed. But since our simple web server only consists of a couple of lines, you can use a basic Ubuntu image and run the hello world script with the EC2 user data settings. When you start EC2 instance, you can give it a script or cloud init command through user data. And the virtual machine will run it during the first startup. You can add a script to user data in your Terraform code by setting the user data argument like this. Take a note of two points in the code we just created. The EOF symbols in Terraform lets you write strings that span multiple lines without needing to add backslash n characters everywhere. The user data replace on change parameter is set to true so that when you change the user data parameter, 
and run apply, Terraform will terminate the original instance and launch a totally new one. Terraform's default behavior is to update original instance in place. But since user data runs only on the very first boot and your original instance already went through that boot process, you need to force the creation of a new instance to ensure your new user data script actually gets executed. One more step is needed to make the web server work. AWS blocks all incoming and outgoing traffic for EC2 instance by default. To let EC2 instance accept traffic on port 8080, you must create a security group. This code creates a new resource called AWS Security Group. Notice that all AWS provider resources start with AWS underscore. It allows incoming TCP requests on port 8080 from this cedar block. Cedar blocks are a short way to define IP address ranges. For instance, a cedar block slash 24 includes all IP addresses between 0 and 255. The cedar block slash 0 covers all possible IP addresses. So this security group lets any IP send requests on port 8080. Creating a security group alone isn't sufficient. You must also link it to EC2 instance by providing the security group ID to the VPC security group ID's argument within AWS instance resource. To do this, you first need to understand Terraform expressions. A Terraform expression is something that produces a value. You've seen basic expressions like literals which include strings like MI and numbers like 5, Terraform has many other types of expressions that you'll encounter in this tutorial. One particularly useful type of expression is a reference, letting you use values from other parts of your code. To get the security group resource ID, you'll need a resource attribute reference, which follows this syntax where provider is the name of the provider, for example, AWS. Type is the type of resource, for example, security group. Name is the name of that resource, for example, the security group is named instance. And attribute is either one of the arguments of that resource, for example, name, or one of the attributes exported by the resource. You can find the list of available attributes in the documentation for each resource. The security group exports an attribute called ID, so the expression to reference it will look like this. You can use the security group ID in the VPC security group ID's argument of the AWS instance as follows. When you add a reference from one resource to another, you create implicit dependency. Terraform parses these dependencies, builds a dependency graph from them, and uses that to automatically determine in which order it should create resources. For example, if you were deploying this code from scratch, Terraform would know that it needs to create this security group before EC2 instance, since the EC2 instance references ID of the security group. You can even get Terraform to show you the dependency graph by running the graph command. The output is in graph description language called dot. When Terraform processes your dependency tree, it creates as many resources simultaneously as possible, making your changes quite efficient. That's the advantage of the declarative language. You simply define what you want and Terraform figures out the most efficient way to achieve it. When you run apply command, you'll notice that Terraform plans to create a security group and replace the EC2 instance with a new one containing the updated user data. The minus and plus in the plan output means replace. Look for the text forces replacement in the plan output to figure out what is forcing Terraform to do a replacement. Since you set user data replace on change to true and change the user data parameter, this will force a replacement, which means that the original EC2 instance will be terminated and a completely new instance will be created. It's worth mentioning that while the web server is being replaced, any users of that web server would experience downtime. You'll see how to do a zero downtime deployment with Terraform later in this tutorial. 
Since the plan appears to be correct, type yes and you'll see your new EC2 instance being deployed. Click on your new instance to find its public IP address in the description panel at the bottom of the screen. Allow the instance a minute or two to start up and then use a web browser or a tool like curl to send HTTP request to this IP address on port 8080. You now have a fully functional web server running on AWS. You may have observed that the web server code mentions port 8080 in both the security group and user data configuration. This goes against don't repeat yourself dry principle, which states that every piece of knowledge must have a single authoritative representation within a system. Having the port number in two places can lead to updating it in one spot while forgetting to make the same change in the other. To allow you make your code more dry and more configurable, Terraform allows you to define input variables. Here is how to declare a variable. When you declare a variable, you can include these optional parameters in it. It's always a good idea to include a description for your variable. This helps explain its purpose. Your team can see this explanation both when they look at the code and when they execute certain commands. You can assign a value to the variable in several ways. You can do it directly when you run command by using the var option. Or you can use a file with the var file option. You can also use environment variable that Terraform will look for named tf var variable name. If you don't give the variable a value, it will use a backup or default value. If there isn't a default value, Terraform will ask you to provide one. The type option lets you set rules about what kind of data a user can put into the variable. Terraform can handle many types of data like text, numbers, true false values, lists, maps sets, objects, tuples, and more. It's a good idea to set a data type to prevent mistakes. If you don't choose a type, Terraform will accept any type of data. The validation option lets you make your own rules for what the variable can be beyond just the type of the data. For example, you could set a rule that a number has to be within a certain range. The sensitive option, if turned on, means Terraform won't show this variable when you run certain commands. This is useful for hiding sensitive data like passwords or API keys that you put into your Terraform code. Check out the detailed guide on how to handle secrets in your Terraform code for more details. In the case of the web server, you need a variable that holds the information about the port number. Remember that the server port input variable doesn't have a default value. So if you run apply command now, Terraform will ask you to give a value for the server port. It will also show you what this variable is for. If you don't want to be asked for the variable value while running the program, you can give the value directly using the var option in the command line. You can also assign a value to the variable using environment variable. The environment variable should be named tf var name, where name is the name of the variable you want to set. If you don't want to keep track of additional command line instructions every time you run plan or apply, you can set a default value for the variable. If you want to use a value from input variable in your Terraform code, you can use a different kind of expression called variable reference. Here is how you write it. For instance, this is how you can assign from port and to port settings of the security group the same value as the server port variable. It's also a good idea to use the same variable when setting the port in the user data script. To use a reference inside a string, you need to use a different kind of expression called interpolation. You can put any valid reference inside the curly braces and Terraform will turn it into a string. For instance, this is how you can use var server port inside the user data script. In addition to input variables, Terraform also allows you to define output variables by using the following syntax. 
the name is the output variable's name, and value can be any expression in Terraform that you want to display. The config can have these optional parameters. Similar to input variables, it's always a good idea to use a description to explain what kind of data the output variable holds. If you turn on the sensitive option, Terraform won't show this output when you run the plan or apply commands. This is useful if the output variable holds sensitive data like passwords or private keys. Now, depends on. Normally, Terraform automatically figures out your dependency graph based on the references within your code. But in rare situations, you have to give it extra hints. For example, perhaps you have an output variable that returns the IP address of a server, but that IP won't be accessible until a security group firewall is properly configured for that server. In that case, you may explicitly tell Terraform there is a dependency between the IP address output variable and the security group resource using depends on. For instance, instead of manually searching for your server's IP address in the EC2 console, you can have the IP address displayed automatically using output variable. This code again uses reference to attribute, this time pointing to public IP attribute of the AWS instance resource. If you run apply command again, Terraform won't make any changes since you didn't change any resources, but it will display the new output at the end. As you can see, output variables appear in the console after you run Terraform apply. This can be helpful for those using your Terraform code. For example, you'll know which IP address to check once the web server is up and running. You can also use the Terraform output command to see all outputs without making any changes. And you can also run Terraform output to see the value of a specific output variable. This is especially useful for writing scripts. For instance, you could make a script that runs Terraform apply to set the web server, then uses Terraform output public IP to get its public IP. Then it could use curl on the IP as a quick check to make sure that setup worked. Running a single server is a good first step, but in real world, if you have one server and it breaks down or gets too much traffic, people won't be able to visit your website. The best way to avoid this is to have a group of servers. If one fails, you can switch to another. Plus, you can add or remove servers depending on how much they've been used. Managing such a cluster manually is a lot of work. Fortunately, you can let AWS take care of it for you by using Autoscaling Group. Autoscaling Group takes care of a lot of tasks for you completely automatically, including launching a cluster of EC2 instances, monitoring the health of each instance, replacing failed instances, adjusting the size of the cluster in response to load. The first thing you need to do when setting up Autoscaling Group is to create a launch configuration. This tells AWS how each Amazon EC2 instance in the Autoscaling Group should be set up. When you're creating AWS launch configuration resource, it uses pretty much the same parameters as the AWS instance resource. However, there are a few differences. Firstly, AWS launch configuration doesn't support tags. You'll be dealing with those later when you're working with the AWS Autoscaling Group resource. Secondly, it doesn't need user data replace on change parameter because Autoscaling Group automatically launch new instances. Also, two of the parameters have different names in AWS launch configuration. The AMI parameter is now called image ID and VPC security group IDs is now security groups. So you need to replace AWS instance with AWS launch configuration. Now you can create Autoscaling Group itself by using AWS Autoscaling Group resource. This Autoscaling Group will provision between 2 and 10 Amazon EC2 instances, with the default being 2 for the initial start. Each instance will have a tag called web. It's important to note that Autoscaling Group uses a reference to provide the launch configuration name. 
However, this might cause a problem. Launch configurations are immutable, so if you adjust any part of your launch configuration, like change the text of the hello world, Terraform will attempt to replace it. Usually, Terraform would delete the old resources before creating a new one. But because Autoscaling Group is using a reference to the old resource, Terraform can't delete it. And when you'll try to apply, you'll get an error. To fix this issue, you can use a lifecycle setting. Every resource in Terraform supports several lifecycle settings that control how that resource is created, updated or deleted. A useful lifecycle setting is create before destroy. If you turn create before destroy on, Terraform will reverse the order it replaces resources in. It will create the new resource first, updating any references from the old resource to the new one and then it will get rid of the old resource. This also can be helpful for manual blue-green deployments with EC2 instances. You can add the lifecycle block to your AWS launch configuration in the following way. There is another parameter you need to add to your autoscaling group to get it working – subnet IDs. This parameter tells autoscaling group which VPC subnets to deploy the EC2 instances in. Each subnet is located in a separate AWS Availability Zone AZ, which is essentially isolated data center. By spreading your instances across multiple availability zones, you can make sure your service stays up and running even if some of the data centers go down. You could manually provide the list of subnets, but that would be hard to maintain and not very flexible. So, a better way to go would be to use data sources to dynamically pull up the list of subnets in your AWS account. Data sources represent read-only information that is pulled from the provider, in this case AWS, every time you run Terraform. Adding a data source to your Terraform settings doesn't create anything new. It's simply a way to ask the providers APIs for data and make that data available for the rest of your Terraform code. Each Terraform provider offers a variety of data sources. For instance, AWS provider has data sources for looking up VPC data, subnets data, AMI IDs, IP address ranges, the current user's identity and a lot more. The syntax for using a data source is very similar to the syntax of a resource. In this case, provider refers to the name of the provider, like AWS. Type is the kind of data source you want to use, for instance VPC. Name is identifier you can use within your Terraform code to refer to this data source. Config is made up of one or more arguments that are unique to that particular data source. For example, you can use AWS VPC data source to pull up data for your default VPC like this. Remember that with data sources, the arguments you usually provide act as search filters, telling the data source what information you're after. With the AWS VPC data source, the only filter you need is default equal to true. This tells Terraform to find the default VPC in your AWS account. To extract data from the data source, you use the following attribute reference syntax. For instance, if you want to get ID of the VPC from the AWS VPC data source, you would use this syntax. You can combine this with another data source, AWS subnets, to find the subnets within that VPC. Lastly, you can extract the subnet IDs from the AWS subnets data source and instruct your autoscaling group to use those subnets through the argument called VPC zone identifier. At this stage, you can deploy your autoscaling group, but there is a minor issue. You now have multiple servers each with its own IP address. But usually you'd want to give your end users just one IP to use. Solution to this problem is to set up a load balancer to distribute traffic across your servers and to give all your users the IP or actually the DNS name of the load balancer. However, creating a highly available and scalable load balancer can be a lot of work. But once again, AWS can handle this for you, this time by using Amazon Elastic Load Balancer ELB service. AWS offers three types of load balancers. 
Application Load Balancer ALB Best suited for load balancing HTTP and HTTPS traffic Operates at the application layer layer 7 of the OSI model Then we have Network Load Balancer NLB Best suited for load balancing TCP, UDP and TLS traffic Can scale up and down in response to load faster than the application load balancer The NLB is designed to scale to tens of millions of requests per second Operates at the transport layer, layer 4 of the OSI model And finally, classic load balancer CLB this is a legacy load balancer that predates both the application and network load balancers. It can handle HTTP, HTTPS, TCP and TLS traffic but with far fewer features than either ALB or NLB. Operates at both application layer layer 7 and transport layer layer 4 of the OSI model. Most modern applications should use either application load balancer or network load balancer. Given that the simple web server project we're working on is HTTP app without any high performance demands, the ALB is going to be the most suitable option. The ALB consists of several parts. First is a listener. Listens on a specific port, for example 80, and protocol, for example HTTP. Then listener rule. It takes requests that come into a listener and sends those that match specific paths or host names. And finally target groups. One or more servers that receive requests from the load balancer. The target group also performs health checks on these servers and sends requests only to healthy nodes. The initial step is to create application load balancer itself by using AWS LB resource. Notice that subnets parameter set up the load balancer to use all subnets in your default VPC by utilizing AWS subnets data source. AWS load balancers are not just a single server but multiple servers that can operate in separate subnets and therefore separate data centers. AWS automatically adjusts the number of load balancer servers based on the traffic and manages fail over if one of those servers fail, providing scalability and high availability right out of the gate. The next action is to create a listener for the application load balancer using AWS LB listener resource. This listener sets up ALB to listen on the standard HTTP port, which is port 80. It uses HTTP as the protocol and sends a simple 404 page as the default response for requests that don't match any listener rules. It's important to note that all AWS resources including ALB don't allow any incoming or outgoing traffic by default. Therefore, you need to create a new security group specifically for the ALB. On the other hand, AWS Network Load Balancer will use EC2 security groups. This security group should permit incoming requests on port 80 so you can access the load balancer over HTTP and allow outgoing requests on all ports so that the load balancer can conduct health checks. You need to instruct the AWS LB resource to use this security group through the security groups argument. Next, you need to create a target group for your auto-scaling group using the AWS LB target group resource. This target group will check the health of your instances by regularly sending HTTP requests to each instance. It will only consider the instance healthy if the instance returns a response that matches the configured matcher. For example, you can set a matcher to look for 200 OK response. If the instance fails to respond, possibly because it's down or overloaded, it will be marked as unhealthy and the target group will automatically stop routing traffic to it to reduce disruption for your users. So how does the target group know which EC2 instances to send requests to? You could attach a fixed list of EC2 instances to the target group using AWS LB target group attachment resource. But with autoscaling group, instances can start or stop at any time, making a fixed list impractical. 
Instead, you can use direct integration between Autoscaling Group and Application Load Balancer. Go back to AdobeS Autoscaling Group resource and set its target group IRANs argument to point to your new target group. You should also change the health check type to ELB. The default health check type is EC2, which is a basic health check that only considers instance unhealthy. If AdobeS hypervisor reports that VM is totally down or unreachable, the ELB health check is more thorough, as it instructs Autoscaling Group to use target group health check to decide whether instance is healthy and to automatically replace instances if the target group reports them as unhealthy. This means that instances will be replaced not only if they completely down, but also if, for example, they've stopped serving requests because they run out of memory or a critical process crashed. Finally, it's time to connect all these elements by creating listener rules using AdBS LB listener rule resource. The code provided adds a listener rule that directs requests matching any path to the target group that contains your autoscaling group. There is one final step before you deploy the load balancer. You need to replace the old public IP output of the single EC2 instance you had earlier with an output that displays the DNS name of the application load balancer. Go ahead and run Terraform Apply and make sure to go through the plan output. You should see that your original single EC2 instance is scheduled for removal. And in its place, Terraform will create a launch configuration, autoscaling group, application load balancer and a security group. If the plan looks good, type yes and hit enter. When the apply process completes, you should see ALB DNS name output. Make a note of this URL. It will take a couple of minutes for the instances to start up and be recognized as healthy by the application load balancer. While you wait, you can examine what you have deployed. Open up the Autoscaling Group section of the EC2 console and you should see that Autoscaling Group has been created. If you switch to the Instances tab, you'll see the two EC2 instances starting up. If you click Load Balancer tab, you'll see your application load balancer. Finally, if you click Target Groups tab, you can find your target group. If you select your target group and locate the target tab at the bottom half of the screen, you'll be able to see your instances registering with the target group and undergoing health checks. Wait for the status indicator to show healthy for both of them. This usually takes between 1 or 2 minutes. Once you see this, you can test DNS name output you saved earlier. Alright, application load balancer is now directing traffic to your EC2 instances. Every time you access the URL, it will select a different instance to handle the request. Congrats, you now have a fully operational cluster of web servers. At this point, you can test how your cluster behaves when new instances are start out or old ones are shut down. For example, go to Instances tab and terminate one of the instances by selecting its checkbox clicking the Actions button at the top and setting the instance state to terminate. Now keep testing the application load balancer URL and you should receive 200 OK for each request even while an instance is being terminated, as the ALB will automatically detect that the instance is down and stop directing traffic to it. In a short time after the instance is shut down, the autoscaling group will detect that fewer than two instances are running and will automatically start a new one to replace it. It's called self-healing. You can also see how autoscaling group adjusts its size by changing the mean size and max size parameters or adding a desired capacity parameter to your Terraform code and rerunning apply. Once you've done experimenting with Terraform, it's a good idea to delete all the resources you created so that AdWS doesn't charge you for them. Since Terraform keeps track of what resources you created, cleanup is easy. All you need to do is run destroy command. I have a playlist in which I go in detail about other Terraform features and best practices. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.